Hi everyone, in honor of Mother's Day, we wanted to read scripture today that had uh, meaning for mothers, family life, and the most significant passage in the Bible is Proverbs 31. Now what's interesting is Proverbs 31 is actually an acrostic. So the author was taking each letter of the Hebrew alphabet and forming the, the verses around that. So it ends up becoming a quite a long list of wonderful characteristics that can be held in a, in a mother, in a wife, uh, functioning in a family. Uh, by no means is it intended for someone to hit all of the metrics, uh, but today we, we honor uh, mothers and we'll reflect as we go through this. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is for, worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night and she provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it and out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. See, she is clothed with dignity and strength. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. And the key, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. On April the 25th, the world's richest man and Tesla CEO, Elon Musk, bought Twitter for $44 billion. In speaking to his motivation, he said, free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. Just a little more than a year earlier, on January the 8th, 2021, the President of the United States at that time, Donald Trump, was banned from that same social media platform. This past week, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security announced the formation of a disinformation governance board. The announcement evoked quick and fierce opposition, with critics calling it Orwellian, with the United States government literally creating the equivalent of a ministry of truth, as Orwell called it in his famous book. Meanwhile, here in Canada, on February the 2nd of this year, the government introduced Bill C-11, referred to as the Online Streaming Act. The government says that it is mainly about protecting Canadian content, but those who have taken the time to properly understand it see its effects on the internet and user-generated content as being far-reaching and providing the government with very strong powers. 
John chapter 18, after Jesus was arrested, he was brought before Pontius Pilate, who was mostly interested in knowing if Jesus was claiming to be a king or not. Look at what Jesus said there in that passage. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason why I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. You know, even in Jesus' day, there was a sense of skepticism when it came to whether or not anyone could really know the truth, and you hear that expressed in Pilate's words. But that really is the discussion at hand today in week three of our series, Snakes and Doves. And not only was the question of what is truth important, but the follow-up questions. Who decides what is true? Who has the power to silence, censure, or even punish someone for holding the wrong version of the truth? Guys, these are extremely important questions that we're looking at today. Welcome back to our series, Snakes and Doves, a series where we are trying to help people think biblically about some of today's hottest topics while also being gentle as we engage in that discussion. Snakes and Doves. In the first two weeks, we looked at the topic of oppression, and today we are going to discuss, as promised, cancel culture. Well, the website compellingtruth.com defines it this way. When an unpopular statement or opinion results in drastic efforts to silence, banish, or punish the offending party, that's an example of cancel culture. This canceling goes beyond condemning offending behavior, or choosing not to support the person, it frequently extends to demands that they be fired from their job, dissociated from their peers, silenced or banished from public view, and so forth. The word culture is used because we are talking about much more than just a few isolated incidents. We are talking about a widespread movement of silencing that works really at a cultural le level. In other words, behind the separate incidents that appear in the news about people being canceled, there is this larger battle taking place over who is going to define the culture that we are a part of. Now, of course, as members of the kingdom of God, uh, we who are Christians, we have a preferred culture that is formed by Jesus. And while we understand that our preferences are not necessarily embraced by the larger culture around us, we do still try to promote those values, knowing that they will bring the most benefit to people in general, whether they're believers or non-believers. And since we are members of God's kingdom, we do our best to follow his thinking uh, on such matters. And that means looking into God's word, which we've been doing through this series, and trying to understand both the mind of God and the heart of God. And so let's look at some aspects of cancel culture today, and let's continue to uncover biblical principles that it can apply to the topic as we go through. Let's start with a little discussion on the Me Too movement. You know, people can be canceled for actions, for words, and even thoughts. And one of the places where cancel culture made the headlines over the past few years was in relation to sexual abuse cases that started to become exposed. And once victims of sexual abuse started to feel empowered to speak, the dam just kind of broke open and accusations of inappropriate behavior began flooding our news feeds. One New York Times article from October of 2018 actually lists 201 names of well-known canceled men. Just in case uh, you've forgotten, let me remind you of a few of those names. You know, guys like Kevin Spacey or Woody Allen, uh, Aziz Ansari from Parks and Rec, Louis C.K., the comedian, James Franco, Al Franken, Mark Halperin um, from NBC, also Matt Lauer from NBC, Paul Marciano, who's the founder of the fashion company Guess, Bill Hybels, the famous pastor from Willow Creek, uh, Jeffrey Tambor from Arrested Development, Marshall Falk, the, fam the famous football player, and then, of course, there's Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. Well, as we talk about principles that apply, let's begin with this obvious one, and that is your sin will find you out. The Bible backs this up. Jesus said it in Luke chapter 12. He says, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. 
In Ecclesiastes, it says, For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And then way back in Numbers chapter 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. So guys, whether it's in this life or the next, God will bring about justice, even to the darkest secrets that exist. And this Me Too movement, it really was necessary, and it was good in many ways. It brought huge amounts of abuse to light, and it hopefully will discourage that kind of abuse in the future. I'm really hopeful that it will. You know, there's a time when people's offenses do disqualify them indefinitely from continuing in the same position that they were in, and that's particularly true in churches. We see that. Here's another principle that applies to cancel culture, and that is that God is the ultimate avenger, but people are responsible to hold each other to account. And that's really what this, you know, kind of touches on. In the Bible, we see lots of people holding each other in account, whether it's families or judges, the law, kings, government, prophets, and so on. And so we have that responsibility as human beings. In God's ideal community, and we call that the church, we see this responsibility in force. Look at Luke chapter 17. It says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And we see that kind of language in different places. From Christ, we see it from Paul. So we all have a part to play in protecting one another. We are, in a certain sense, our brother's keeper. Another principle, number three, God expects us to use the proper channels to render justice. Now, in our haste to get justice, we have to remember that God is not in favor of vigilantism, all right? Uh, It's just not everybody free for all, go and take care of things, take matters into your own hands. Our God is a God of due process. In Matthew chapter 18, look at what it says. Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. That's the first step. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Now, a pagan or tax collector, that means treat them like an unbeliever. In other words, at that point, stop using the structures in the church, actually go to the courts with that person. And so what is God's prescription? Well, inside of the church, he says, use church leadership. Outside of the church, go to the governments or the courts for justice. First Peter chapter 2, Peter says, submit yourselves uh, for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You know, church leaders and government officials have God's stamp of approval for dealing with offenses. It doesn't mean that they're all perfect or that they all make good decisions, but he puts his stamp of approval on that type of a structure. But media and social media do not have that authority to render verdicts. So we have to think about that um, as we're talking about cancel culture. Number four, justice must be fair and it must be executed properly. You know, when people are blacklisted by anyone and everyone without a fair hearing or trial, that is what you call a miscarriage of justice. Deuteronomy chapter 1, when Moses was reviewing the law with the Israelites before entering the promised land, he reminded the people of how God led him to set up a fair system of justice. And he says this, he says, So I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men, and appointed them to have authority over you as commanders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and as tribal officials. And I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly, whether the case is between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring to me any case too hard for you, and I will hear it. And so you see that there in this passage. He says, hear the disputes, judge fairly, do not show partiality, he says. One of the big problems with the Me Too movement is that people were not given a fair hearing. People were tried in what we call the court of public opinion, which, according to what we're seeing from Scripture, is wrong. They were not given a fair trial, which, what we, according to what we see from Scripture, is wrong. This passage actually suggests that an accused person needs the opportunity to defend him or herself. 
And guys, our entire justice system is based on this biblical idea, hence the saying that we use so often, innocent until proven guilty. You know, in oppressive countries, people are often considered guilty until proven innocent. If you ever have the opportunity to read the Gulag Archipelago, uh, you will learn about the atrocities that happened under Joseph Stalin, and you will gain a new appreciation for due process when it comes to justice. We take this right sorely for granted in North America. Well, Christian esper experts on this topic, like Rod Dreher, who wrote the book Live Not By Lies, they say that the, this cancel culture that we're experiencing is producing a form of soft totalitarianism that we should find very alarming. Justice has to be executed properly. Principle number five, justice carries a burden of proof with it. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, it says, one witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense that they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And that was the passage that Jesus was quoting from. Now this is probably the clearest violation yet in the Me Too movement, with many of the accused never getting to share their side of the story, and with accusers never having to back up their claims. And so that's obviously problematic. Because this principle wasn't followed in the Me Too cancellations, numerous innocent people had their reputations completely destroyed, and their livelihoods very often as well. As we learned last week, no specific identity group is more or less sinful than another. And so although men are much, you know, more often offenders when it comes to sexual aggression, men are not intrinsically more sinful than women, and sometimes women do lie or exaggerate the truth. And we've seen a few examples of that as we've tracked along in the Me Too discussion. Now we can understand the passion behind the Believe Women movement, and that's one that you know people just kind of got on and said, you just, we just automatically have to believe women in these situations. But that cannot excuse the need for due process. And I think as the movement went along, people began to see this more clearly. After the pendulum had swung it, it started to settle more in the middle. To this day, there are serious doubts about how guilty some of the canceled people really were. One example of that is Aziz Ansari. You know, it sounds pretty different depending on whose version of the story you're hearing. And guys, that's just a principle in general, you know, always hearing two sides of the story. And I'm not just saying this because uh, Parks and Rec is one of the best shows ever. I'm just pointing out what others have noticed. True justice carries a burden of proof, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. Well, in most of these cases, guys, the offenders, usually men, acknowledged their wrongdoing, at least to some extent. Some tried to skirt it, but many of them acknowledged it. And when it comes to sexual abuse or harassment, there is not only a broad agreement on the unacceptability of such action, but society is quite aligned with the moral standards of Scripture when it comes to these things. So in cases where the action was proven or admitted, Virtually everyone was happy to see these people being canceled, to lose their reputation or to pay some price for their actions. But here's the thing. Not all cancellations are quite so unanimous. And so let's move on to the discussion of political and moral ideologies that often get tied into this discussion. You know, American politics in particular are very polarized. Lines have been drawn and people have been taking sides on either side of those lines for decades now. Increasingly, people entrenched on either side are losing their ability, it seems, to actually be objective and to have conversation. When Donald Trump came on the political scene prior to the 2016 election, he became a very polarizing force, attracting large amounts of love and hate alike from different camps. In discussing his plans for a border wall, he said, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best, they're not sending you, they're not sending you, they're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Well, as you may remember, those on the left really focused on, you know, criminals and rapists, that part of the quote. And people on the right said, well, they reminded us that many Democratic presidents 
also promised to build a wall. Was Trump any different? Uh, Trump actually gained support, they say, among black and Latino voters over his four years in office. Well, when Trump was caught using lewd locker room talk, the left said he is misogynistic, and, you know, it certainly has that appearance to it. Those on the right, though, would say, well, everyone was a lot more forgiving of Bill Clinton, who actually has some real, really serious allegations against him, not just talk. Well, whether you like Trump or not, most would agree that he could start by being much more careful in the way that he uses words. So why don't we start with that principle, principle number six. God expects people to use words positively. As we're talking about cancel culture, we have to acknowledge that the way that people use words is important. In Proverbs chapter 12, it says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And guys, again, wherever you stand, I think we can all agree, Trump could learn from a verse like that. Prime Minister Trudeau could learn from a verse like that too, as could many, many politicians. In a few minutes, we're going to get into the dangers of canceling and of losing free speech. But for now, let's establish that even with free speech, God expects people, especially believers like us, to use words that build people up. Can we all agree on that? Can we start there, right? Ephesians 4, chapter 29, let no unwholesome talk proceed out of your mouth, but only what is useful for edifying, for building people up. And while we're on that note of using words properly, let's go to principle number seven, and that is that God has called us to live in peace. Let's not forget this as we're talking about cancel culture. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, we're reminded, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You ever, ever seen this one on social media or heard this one? If you disagree, just unfriend me now right? You've, you've seen that one, right? And I, I see stuff like that sometimes, and I go, what? Like, that's not living at peace. That's just cancellation. That's just writing off people who have a different perspective from you. And guys, let's be honest. When it comes to this topic of cancel culture, some of us are guilty of the same thing on a personal level. Now, I understand that some people just post way too much, and sometimes you need to mute them. I get that but we shouldn't be unfriending people because of political ideologies. But that's what's happening these days. It really is, and it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, once the culture gave itself permission to cancel Trump, the cancellation began to spread to anyone who liked Trump. That was kind of the next phase in that progression. And then after that, it mutated into the cancellation of anyone who held non-progressive views. You will remember some of these cancellations, perhaps. There was Chris Harrison, who's the host of The Bachelor. Bachelor contestant Rachel Kirk Connell came under fire for resurfaced photos that showed her attending an Old South-themed party at a plantation in 2018. And Harrison, not meaning to defend Kirk Connell, questioned if that type of themed party would be frowned upon in the same way in 2018 as it was in 2021. Well, just for making that statement, pressure came down so heavy on him that he had to resign. We all know J.K. Rowling, the renowned famous, you know, Harry Potter author and ardent feminist. She came under heavy fire when she had the audacity to speak the truth about gender. She said, if sex isn't real, there's no same-sex attraction. That's what she tweeted to her 14 and a half million followers. If sex isn't real, she says, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, she said, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth, she said. Well, if she wasn't so popular for her novels, she would have probably been suspended from Twitter by now for that comment. Many of you know Gina, uh, Gina Carano, the Mandalorian actress, was fired by Disney after posting on social media that being a Republican in 2021 felt similar to being Jewish during Nazi Germany. Her Hollywood agent dropped her, and Hasbro scrapped her Star Wars action figures. Many believe that her cancellation had more to do with her political views than actually offending Jews by her comments. You can check it out and decide for yourself. Well, then there's also Matthew Iglesias, who is the liberal opinion writer who resigned from Fox 
or from Vox rather, a publication that he co-founded. And he resigned after many of his progressive colleagues found his articles too right of center. Iglesias argued against defunding the police back in the summer of 2020 when that was a big conversation. And he took aim at the liberal term Latinx um, as alienating many people from progressive politics and the Democratic Party. He has since joined Substack so he can voice his opinions more freely. Guys, I'm telling you, there are so many more examples that could be shared here as it relates to cancel culture. And just in case anyone is thinking that I'm saying cancellation is only a kind of left-wing thing, let me remind you that before all of this cancel culture really became the big thing that it was, uh, a guy named Colin Kaepernick was effectively canceled way back in 2016 for taking a knee during the national anthem. And so it's not just one side here, guys. This goes back and it cuts both ways. It was a bit different in this situation in that it was the NFL that punished him, not the news media or culture as a whole. In fact, Nike actually hired him for some ads as a result. But both left and right are capable of canceling, and I want to be very clear about that. The question then becomes, how do we avoid falling into these camps and these what we call silos of thought, where we're just always entrenched in the same thoughts? And I would encourage you with this principle, that comes from scripture, and that is that our moral judgments must be formed by God. This is so important for us, guys. As Christians, we can never let political agendas determine what we believe. We may prefer one party over another, but we must always acknowledge that no party is perfect and that politicians usually value political expediency over morality, right? We are world enough to understand that. We can have our political opinions, but we need to be able to see and understand those who view things differently from us. God is the judge of the universe, and he is the one who decides what is right. So let's go to him first and foremost. Principle number nine, wise people look deeper in their search for answers. We mentioned this principle last week, and it carries over into dis today's discussion as well. See, our reflex needs to be to understand people who differ from us in opinion, not to write them off, which has become the reflex for so many people. Another principle that we saw from week one that I'll repeat again today, number 10, God is a God of grace and redemption. He is a God of grace and redemption. And the more that you become familiar with cancel culture, much, much of it really is driven by negative emotions, not by love. Uh, when you really dig into it, what you see is that it is spiteful, it is judgmental, it is unforgiving, it really possesses no grace whatsoever. Its goal is not just to rebuke or to correct, but it is to banish and destroy. Its labels are permanent. And this is a characteristic of cancel culture. Guys, as believers, even when we must discipline our fellow believers in the church, the Bible says that that's always with a vision to restoration, but that is not the spirit behind cancel culture. Cancel culture leaves no room for redemption and that is a problem because redemption is truly at the heart of God. You know, guys, once a person has been canceled, they've been written off. And that really does violate the heart of God and of Christ. Principle number 11 that applies to cancel culture, God does not show partiality and neither should we. That's the one that we actually learned back in week one, that God is impartial, and that means that he is able to be completely objective in everything that he does. Remember, guys, we are called to be like God. That means that we better be sure that we are giving people a fair shake when we are evaluating their points of view. That is a godly thing to do. While all of this cancellation put the focus on the topic of human rights, and specifically freedom of speech and freedom of conscience. And so let's go there next in this conversation. Freedom of speech. How are we supposed to think about this topic as believers? You know, it was really interesting as I've thought about this whole concept of freedom and speech. Back in the 80s, I remember that it was really the left who fought against censorship as Christians and conservatives complained about things that were becoming more popular, like pornography, you know, that was more popular in, in videos as video became more popular, lewd speech, music videos, and language in those music videos. I remember the band Frozen Ghost and the song Should I See. Um, here were the lyrics. He says, you take away freedom of choice, take away the right to voice, my beliefs and all my views, you take away my right to choose. 
And then in the course it said, show me what should I see, make my mind up for me. And I remember that song very clearly. I love anyone Frozen Ghost fans out there. Um, but today, it's funny, it's predominantly the left that is fighting for more censorship today. And so this kind of flip-flopping over time just highlights even more that positions change, ideas change. It's even more reason why we need the timeless truth of God's word and to be following what he says. Well, principle number 12, God values freedom. This is a huge, huge principle that's really important. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul reminds the Corinthians that we are called to be free. But this assertion that God values freedom, it really comes more from a general assessment of God's character than from any specific verse or command. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, we're, we're reminded that God causes the sun to rise, right, on the evil and the good, that he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. In other words, God actually puts the air in the lungs of the person who chooses to curse him. And that tells us something about the character of God. Going right back to Genesis chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden, we see God's affinity for free will and his disinclination to control us, right? He, he gives a choice by putting trees there in the garden. We see it also in his refusal to coerce us into a relationship with him. After all, think about it, God could simply overwhelm us with his glory and we would all bow the knee to him immediately, right? You ever th thought about that? But no, instead he gives us freedom. But proponents of cancel culture, do you know it? They, they seem to hate freedom. They value manipulation and intimidation. That's the way that they deal with people who have a different opinion from them. Guys, remember, God values freedom and he values choice. And nations that have tapped into that value have flourished. And that's a very important thing to note as well. So as Christians, we need to be like our Father in heaven in this matter. In her 1906 biography, The Friends of Voltaire, English writer Beatrice Evelyn Hall talked about the time when Voltaire stood up for another writer whose books had been burned, and this quote came from that. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And guys, this was a quote that got repurposed a lot in the 80s during that whole censorship discussion. It took a while for me as a Christian teen to come to grips with the importance of allowing immoral people to voice their opinions, but I came to understand that this is actually consistent with God's character, and it is necessary for a free society. Think about this, guys. Speaking the truth in love is a biblical mandate. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, meaning that speaking the truth is also a biblical mandate. So by extension, any government law that guarantees citizens the right to speak the truth aligns with godly principles, and any law that suppresses a person's right to speak the truth is working against God's command. Well, it's not just government that can sometimes be guilty of suppressing free speech, as we've already seen. People can be canceled by social media companies, uh, by their workplaces, by their friends. And I'm going to wrap things up today with one of the most concerning forces that is really fueling cancel culture today, and that is mainstream media. We've discussed the godly values of critical thinking, of impartiality, of loving your enemies, of trying to understand others' perspectives. But here's the thing, guys. Mainstream media today, um, they're violating all of these principles and more. That term fake news is a term that's become very popular. People are using it passionately on both sides of the political spectrum. And both are correct because both left and right are spinning the news until it is distorted just to favor their own purposes. And this brings us to an important principle from Scripture, number 13. God demands honesty and integrity. The ninth commandment is to not bear false witness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says that as believers, we are not to distort the Bible to our advantage. We do not use deception, but that we set forth the truth plainly, it says there. Guys, that is God's standard. And at one time in North America, news agencies worked at being impartial and at presenting the facts so that people could interpret them. Today, it's not even a secret that news agencies have a bias. They literally announce who they are supporting in elections and coerce their employees to follow suit. Like, you can literally check this out on Wikipedia. You can find out who voted for whom from all of the different media outlets. And as a result, it's getting hard to know who and what to believe these days. 
Left-leaning sources are canceling the right, and right-leaning sources are canceling the left. Guys, wise people have noted that we are most fundamentally made in God's image in the sense that we have a voice. Have you ever thought about this? Think about it. God speaks the world into existence. He speaks, and reality is set in motion. And so think about it. When we silence someone, we actually violate that part of them that is most fundamentally like God. That's serious stuff. After the 2020 election, Donald Trump claimed that the election was stolen, and right-leaning news sources fed into those beliefs. Even high-profile Republicans were convinced that this had happened. But guys, today, there's no conclusive evidence for the fact that the election was stolen. As soon as he won the election back in 2016, rumors were circulated that he had colluded with Russia. It soon became the leading narrative, and voices that disagreed with that narrative were mocked and even canceled. But today, we know that it was a complete hoax created by the Democrats. Pretty much all news sources now are admitting that. So what are the lessons that we learn here, guys? The lessons are, in a polarized world where cancel culture is rampant, we need to be discerning in ascertaining the truth, and we need to defend the rights of people to share their voice. We really do. These are consistent with biblical principles. Guys, the role of media is not to form our opinions. Not to say we never have people who give their opinions, but that's not the role of media. It's to give us access to facts so that we can exercise our freedom in forming our own opinions. Cancel culture doesn't seem so bad when the people that we disagree with are being silenced. We're all like, oh, that's good when that happens, but never forget that what goes around, it comes around. And so I want to wrap things up today with kind of a big picture conclusion. You know, you might not be someone who gets very worked up over these topics, whether it's cancel culture or free speech or unbiased media. I'm going to be honest with you today that I believe that these topics are the most significant issues of our day today. And I believe this because I know that Satan is a wise enemy who works through systems. We talked about that last week. And I know that he is trying to form his own kingdom here on earth with his own truth at the center of it. It has a form of godliness, but it denies the power of God and the gospel. It feels moral, but it runs contrary to God's standards of morality. And his greatest desire is to silence the church. And he will do it by turning the culture against us. And so I want to end with one other principle. And that is that biblical prophecy depicts eventual one world leadership and one world ideology that replaces God's truth. There's a lot that's unclear about biblical prophecy, but that seems very clear as you look at biblical prophecy. As you see, a time is coming for us Christians when our beliefs are no longer going to be tolerated. And if Satan is the prince of this world right now, and he is, then the people that he is most interested in silencing, that's us, the children of God. And so this whole topic of cancel culture, it has serious serious implications for us. Do not be surprised when you see our specific beliefs being targeted. Well, that's all we got time for today. Guys, next week we have a guest speaker. Isaac Whiting is going to be here and he's going to deal with this wedge that Satan has been using today to pit the culture against God's children. That is the topic of sexual identity. So be here next Sunday and hear Isaac speak.